so this week we have a little different kind of program. The first thing I want to say really is that the understanding that we are taught by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet is that every Muslim theoretically is an activist. That you are asked to go out and help to change things in the world. Islam is not a religion that preaches that you save yourself, you go in a mountain, you pray all day and night and you save yourself and you just ignore the, the problems of the world. Every Muslim is obligated to work and to struggle to be able to change things in the world and to, and to help people wherever they can. And so this is a, a really important understanding. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places all the reward on the group, connecting with the group, connecting with the community, that the hand of Allah is with the group, with the group effort. And so each of us should never see our Islam as just, I just stay at home, I pray, I practice it by myself, and I think that I am going to be okay. No, there is a huge social responsibility to be have to help others to be able to understand the message of Islam and also for us to be able to um, go out and help take, to change things in the world. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, when he created everything, the Prophet indicated to us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed excellence in everything. And Allah, in Allah katab al-ihsan ala kulli shay. That Allah has, has prescribed ihsan or excellence in everything. And so whatever the Muslim attempts to do, this should be our motto. That we always strive for excellence. You do it to the best of your ability. You don't just, if you're going to do something, then part of the ethic of Islam is that you give it your best shot. You give it your finest effort. And so this Today we are discussing planning outreach programs to Muslims, how to, to bring Islam to Muslims, how to organize forums where Muslims can come together. And so we should try to do it in an organized and efficient manner as well. Uh, so if you look everywhere, you will see different organizations, different groups planning programs. And you may have gone to programs in which you come when you says, wow, that was done so bad that we didn't benefit anything much. It was disorganized. They started late. The food was late. This was that. I'm sure many of us has probably gone to programs in which when you come away, you felt that it was a bad experience. You know, we should not and cannot afford to have our programs not be less than excellent. So today we're going to learn some of the principles and some of the things that we need to do to be able to organize really good programs for Muslims and non-Muslims as well. Um, for want of a better term, we are calling it outreach programs. And there's a broad definition of that. So why is outreach programs so effective? Some of the benefits are as follows. Number one, it provides a forum for people to gather together. So people get invited and they come to the forum rather than staying at home. So you are able to gather people. And by gathering people, people begin to interact, they get to do themselves and they form relationships. And so they promote, uh, they strengthen their brotherhood. Uh, outreach program also provides those who would like to volunteer uh, that they can come and participate as being one of the organizers. It provides an opportunity to give sadaka because the program of course will have a, a financial aspect to it. They will need money for food or whatever it is that, uh, depending upon the nature of the program. And so you get an opportunity to, to give from your wealth. Most of the outreach programs will have an education or a dawah dimension in which Islam is going to be shared. You should also create in the programs where people can share their ideas as well. And it shouldn't be just you talking to them all the time. You also need to be receiving from them their ideas and their perspectives as well. Uh, some of the programs also can provide training to people in the different skill sets that they may not know. So you can have a seminar, for example, that teaches people uh, 
how to give dawah that we did last week. And so they can be trained in that. One of the, the beautiful things about the programs, when you gather people, the organizers are able to see those people who have potential, who are sincere, who want to really learn more. So they can cultivate a personal relationship with them after the program and help them on their journey. So you can be able to spot and see people who are sincere. And our program should also have an entertainment or a fun aspect to it. Because if you don't have something that people enjoy, they're not going to come back. And so the outreach program should have some aspect of enjoyment where people actually genuinely felt, you know, that they were entertained and they were happy and that the program had a lively aspect to it. The disadvantages of these programs is that it's too short sometimes to accomplish a large goal, and it takes a lot of planning to do. Um, however, the advantages are far greater to justify that we should have outreach program. And I hope each and every one of us should take an opportunity sometime or the other to organize one of these. The only time most families get involved in planning a huge program is if somebody die in the family or you have a wedding, you know, those are usually the only time when you are now exposed to having to plan this massive program. You know, um, sometimes in the Caribbean, they have something called Quran Sharif in which you invite people to come and recite Quran and feed them. So those kinds of programs, uh, families would now have a first taste of it. But we're talking about programs organized specifically to educate, and, and do all of the benefits that we just listed. So what are some of those kind of programs that you can have? So you can have educational programs. So there are seminars, two hour seminars, three hours, five hours, it can be a different variety that provides information. There's something called Kiyama Laila. Kiyama means, uh, Laila means standing in the night. So some of the programs where you, people will gather in the masjid and spend the night in the masjid. And you will have a set program that you will go through during the night. Uh, and it gets called Qiyam al -Lail. Um, You can have live-in courses. When I used to live in Guyana, uh, that's what we used to organize as young, as our, when we were young. We would organize two weeks live-in programs in which we would invite people to come at a particular place for two weeks, sometimes for three weeks. So we would have 120 people uh, young people coming together. We would feed them three meals a day. There's a daily timetable. Uh, and they come and they spend three weeks. And they learn Islam. And they practice Islam. And they develop brotherhood and relationship. And these programs actually you develop lifelong friends. They were very effective. You have camps. You can go for the weekend. Uh, in Florida here, we used to organize a lot of camping uh, weekend trips. In which you would go into the the bushes and the jungles and the parks, and you would camp for the weekend. You can also have lectures as well as part of um, educational type programs. Social, recreational are like picnics, cultural nights, uh, fun day, sports day. So those kind of programs, they also provide uh, educational aspects to them. Uh, and so they, as another kind of um, outreach program. And you can also have outreach programs that are like walkathons, in which you're, you're raising money as well. Fundraisers, dinners, garage sale, car washes. All these are different kinds of outreach programs. And the whole idea behind these programs a lot of times is to provide as many doors as possible for people to come towards Islam, come towards the deed. So someone may be a sports person. And so they will never come to your seminar. But if you have a sports day, they may come through that door and get connected to the Muslim community through the sports. Another one may come through a picnic. Another one may come through, you know, a walk a ton. And so the organizers have to be able to spot these people or when they come and participate to try to bring them along and help them on their journey to become more and more interested in Islam. So these are some types of outreach programs. Uh, to, in order to organize them well, 
you must start with planning. And so you have to set up a kind of a, a, a committee that will begin to make the plans for how we're going to do this whole outreach program. And as the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned, anytime you have a, a group organizing anything, you should select an Amir or Amira. Amira is a sister, Amir is the brother. So you should have, have, you should have one head who is going to run that committee. Um, and each member of the committee, so you'll set up and you will define what is it we're trying to plan. We're trying to plan a camp or a lecture or a seminar. And then you have to break out the different ideas of exactly what you want to accomplish. You set your, um, you begin to discuss. Each member of the committee will be completely involved and assign things to do and follow up. Uh, you may have subcommittees as well. And then meetings have to be scheduled and organized to basically check progress and evaluate how you're coming along. And so the more organized those committees are, the more successful the program will be. Now, one of the things about goals is that you have to ask why we want to have the program. What is it we're trying to accomplish? You know, a lot of time uh, it's important to know what you're trying to accomplish. And it should be expressed in a way that you could measure it. So goals can be vague stuff. Okay, we want to establish, we want, we're going to have this lecture and one of our goals is going to be to build brotherhood. But that is so vague because after the program finish, you're going to ask yourself, did we build brotherhood? We don't even know if we built brotherhood because we haven't defined it properly. So rather than say to build brotherhood, you have to perhaps put it in a format that says, at the end of this program, every per participant we hope will know the names of five other participants. So now you have something you can measure. So you, at the end of the program, you can say to everyone, how, by the show of hands, how many of us know the names of five other members of the group here today? And then you, depending upon how the hands go up, you could say we accomplished our goal by 50% or by 10% or 15%. And you have a measurable way of knowing your success. When you make the goals very broad and general, then you really don't know if you're going or coming. It's like saying, where are you going? We said we're going east. Well, what does that mean? We start driving east. You know, so the more detail your goal is expressed in a measurable format, it should also be a practical goal. Not something in the sky, you know. A lot of times we will plan, it says, how many people are you thinking we are planning to for 10? And then someone will shout out from the committee, let's cater for 500 people. You know, you barely can get 20 people, you know, and they're shooting. So now you've got to plan and cook food for 500 people. So you've got to be realistic and you have to be practical. That's why you need those measurements from past programs to guide you to be realistic. You, whatever goals you set should also be relevant. You know, um, it has to affect the, the current status of people. You don't want to create a program that is archaic, that don't benefit anybody else. It should be cutting edge, different things that are bothering people, affecting people's lives. That's why you're having the program, to, to bring relevant information that will impact people's lives and make them uh, make it better. So it must be better. So the, Goal setting is a very important thing, you know, um, that we should do. I know they have many different acronyms, SMART goals, and different different kind of things that uh, management people do use. But it, the, the bare essence of it is that it should be measurable at the end, should be relevant, should be beneficial, and so on. So that is really critical because without that, then, the whole other, the whole program is going to be based on that. So if you're planning a, a like a lot, now is a, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, a lot of people are planning Yom Nabi celebrations and different things. Um, so you have to be very clear what exactly you're trying to accomplish. And then the next phase is to be able to, uh, once you understand what we're trying to accomplish, you're now going to create uh, 
and define what are the things we need to do, what kind of format we need to have, you know, this, the information we want to present to accomplish our goal. If the goal was, for example, to build brotherhood, um, we have our goal as to have five people, no five names. We're going to have in the program opportunities for people to get to know each other. We're going to have, a, you know, so the format will be dictated by how the goals are set. And so you, you have to define very clearly uh, how we're going to present whatever we want. And so you have to have that discussion. Um, you have many things you have to consider in terms of setting a particular time of the year to hold the program. I remember one year we, we held a, a weekend camp in the Everglades and nobody checked to see when was the best time to go to the Everglades. So we went during the mosquito season. And when we were there, literally you saw it's like two black clouds coming towards you, you know, and it was mosquitoes converging upon us in the camp. And it was a very unique experience because we didn't take the time to check. So you have to check weather conditions. You've got to check the time of the year, the season. You have to check Islamic occasions to make sure they don't conflict with what you want to have. You have to understand uh, what the holidays at a public school because people who coming may have children going to school. So you want to set it at a time when there may be holidays. You have to check and see if there's availability of personnel. Maybe the people who you want to do this program is not available at that time. You have to check a venue availability. So there are many aspects involved before you even pick a time for the program that you've got to consider. Uh, you also have to look and see, is there anyone else planning the same kind of program at the same time? Because that will take away from our attendance. So quite often, this task of just, just simply setting a time, a date, duration, it is a little bit involved. It's not just, you just say, hey, we're going to have it in this and that and that. You know, the people who plan very meticulously will consider all of these areas before they make their final decision that we're going to have this thing at this venue, at this time of the year. So all of that goes into proper planning. And then your timetable, you have to be able to, to, to lay down the timetable in such a way that you could follow it. A lot of times we make the timetable so strict and tight that there's very little time to go awry. You have to be able to set your timetable in such a way that if we end up late at something, the timetable has built in certain spaces that you could catch up back and finish on time. And so you've got to make the timetable uh, a practical one. There must be enough time for breaks. You must make sure that people are comfortable. You have to assess, you know, if we're going to give a, an hour lecture and then we're going to move straight into our next lecture and then into our next lecture, you know, um, people get bored. So you have to be able to give a lot of breaks, a lot of free time, the timetable have to be flexible. And you have to be able to have the ability that should something go strange and weird, that you can readjust some of the items of the timetable right on the spot. So it should be a little bit flexible. Um, you have to consider in setting the timetable, the nature of your audience. If you have a lot of women with their children, then the sessions may have to be a little bit shorter because they have kids, they're distracted. So every 20 minutes, you may have to give a break and so on. So timetable planning of the program has to take these into consideration. And then you have very important thing, which almost everybody just ignores. You know, um, there is a beautiful book written by Dan and Chip Heath called uh, The Power of Moments, I think it's called power of moments a really amazing and what they say is that you know your program you should always every time we have any program you need to make it something have something in the program or the way you have laid out and designed the program that will leave an impression 
a mark, a memory to those who attend, that they will not forget it. We will attend hundreds of programs, but you, the way you design your program should be, you know what? I have attended hundreds of programs, but this program sticks in my mind because the people who planned it catered to have a wow factor, to make the program memorable. And when you begin to think how to be creative and to make your program unique, not just mundane, they're just doing and copying what you've done before. You know, a lot of time that's what we do. You should be so creative that, for example, instead of saying, uh, we're going to discuss Salah, you know, what a boring uh, topic to just say we discuss Salah. You can re-express that to say today, we're going to be talking about how the believers can ascend and have mi'raj. Because if the Prophet said, as salatu mi'raj al mu'mineen Salah is the mi'raj of the believers. So you can re-expect it. I said, this session is about how you can have an ascension to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you create creative names for the topics themselves. You make the decoration creative. You know, the way the presenter presents is unique. So you have to think through how we will make things into a wow factor. And it could be very simple things. You know, it, it don't take a lot to be creative. You know, you can take two palm trees, you know, cut the branches and form an arch at the entrance of the door. So as participants walk in, you know, they're walking in through this, this arch. You know, they will remember that, you know. They will remember different things that you do when you think about when you do that. So this wow factor is really important because what will happen also is that it will encourage people to want to come back again. They're going to want to say, wow, I really like. And I'll give you an example of, of the group we had down here called FAME, Florida Association of Young Muslims. Um, that was what they were good at. When FAME, these young people did a program or anything, they understood the importance and value of the wow factor. I remember my daughter telling me when she was discussing the life of the Prophet Wasallam, she had all the, the, the kids bring a blanket, I mean, a salah mat. And then they had candles. And they went outside and they lit the candles. They sat on their mat. And because they were discussing how the Prophet was sitting in the cave of Hira in the mountain when he got Jibreel coming to give the revelation. So they sat there to, to kind of simulate the experience, sitting in the dark with this candle. And so when you do something, you know, you can take the most mundane thing and make it special. Those kids will remember that incident for the rest of their lives. And so it's really important that we don't be lazy when we're planning any kind of program. Try to think of the wow factor. And if you really want to know the value of that, go and read. The Power of Moments, really important and very important book for all Islamic workers to read. Now, the other thing that we have to look at when we're planning outreach is to be very circumspect about the topics that we're going to uh, be teaching. Uh, make sure you also pick the right people who can present them. The speaker must be informed. And so it's a very tightly uh, controlled environment in which you're making sure your topics are relevant to the people who you're delivering to. I remember going to one uh, big lecture, uh, seminar type lecture, and the speaker thought all of us were from Pakistan. You know, so he began to address us as Pakistanis because he didn't take the time to figure out who his audience was. So all of us was from the Caribbean and he kept bringing examples from Pakistan and India to us. Uh, and completely, it, was, it really felt weird. So you've got to know your audience and you've got to know how to reach the audience with the, uh, the way you discuss the topic and so on. So that's really important. Uh, you must also make sure that there, everybody knows what their role is in terms of the different aspects of the program, who is doing that, who is organizing food, who is organizing time, um, who is the greeter in the front, who is doing registration for the personnel, who is setting up the equipment, who is doing coordinator. 
So all of that has to be planned out. Who is going to be in the kitchen? Uh, so that the program is not, nothing is left to chance. One of the uh, critical parts of program planning is um, the venue. You know, if you don't get the venue right, then it really will affect the program. If you go to a venue, there's no air condition, you can't concentrate on what the person is saying. All the beautiful wow factor and everything goes through the door because you're sweating, you're hot, you're uncomfortable. If the microphone doesn't work well, no matter how eloquent the speaker is, we will not understand what he's saying. So the venue is really a critical part towards the success of the program. So you should always have venue checklists. When you're going to go to check venues of what will work, you should have a checklist in which you can tick off, you know, parking. Yes, we have parking, lights. We have enough light, space. We have safety, water and bathroom facilities, air conditioned facilities. You know, how much is going to cost to rent this place? General facilities like the blackboards. So we need chairs. Do we need a PS system? We need overhead. We need, you know, so you've got to check all of that. The electrical system, such as outlets, that, you know, do you need to get written permission to use the venue? Insurance and legal permits, cleaning and preparing the venue before and after, ensure that you leave it better than you um, took it. All of that comes into venue. And if you don't plan that well, it could end up in a disaster. You know, comfort level. Um, in New York, we had one brother we assigned to pick a venue. And for some reason, nobody double checked him. And so what happened is that it was a cultural evening that we were planning in which we would perform skits and plays and so on. And uh, the people, we would charge ticket. It was in the winter in the Bronx, very cold. And so the brother said, I found a beautiful venue. When we went the day at the venue, it turned out to be actually um, one of those um, nightclubs. So as we entered the building, we realized people were already starting to arrive downstairs in the cold. And we're upstairs looking around at this nightclub with naked women on the walls, bar in the corner, with drinks and all of that. This was the venue that the brother picked. He never went and checked the venue and he just assured everyone it was fine. And so that was one of the most horrible experience we had, you know, to deal with. So venue is very important that you check. And then the propagation has to be considered as well, because you plan all the wonderful program. And if nobody comes, then, you know, it's all for naught because you didn't really um, take time to invite people. So the propagation has to be very efficient. We have to have an idea of how many people are inviting, how many people are, we think are going to attend. And propagation is one of those things that you have to use every available means. Personal contact, word of mouth, telephone, tell a friend, bring a friend. And a lot of times, sometimes you, you can't just tell a friend. You have to promise to pick them up. If you really need them badly to be there, you have to say, look, it's a beautiful program. Most people only come programs because somebody invited them that they know. No one just shows up at the program. It was because there's somebody over there who knows them and personally invited them when they come over. And so uh, you've got to use every means available. So you have a three, three friends. You have to say, look, we have this beautiful program we're going to. I would like you to come. I'm going to come pick you up. So you give them less excuse to refuse. If you tell them, meet us over there, they may never show up. You have to use posters, flyers, uh, you know, and those have to be, one of the things that happens is sometimes a lot of our communities, we, we have like Arabs, Pakistanis, sometimes they, um, there are people who speak English, they understand English, but they don't write English. They don't read English. So you will have sometimes where you will have among us people who can speak English and understand it, but they don't know how to write it. So sometimes you'll have an Arab brother. He can dialogue with you, speak and, and understand English, but 
he can't read it. And so sometimes when you give a flyer in English, uh, he can't relate to that. So that's why you have to have many different ways and you have to know the audience of who you're propagating to, to be able to, um, and you should always have a database of people of who have come to pass programs and all of that so that you can um, be able to access that and, and nurture that and develop that and help people. And if your programs are very good quality, people will eventually get the message that this is the best program to attend, the most beneficial, and your, your, your uh, attendance will improve. Um, we should use the masjid, make announcements, local newspapers, television, all different ways. You know, invitation of cards, and it depends upon the nature of the program, you will use the appropriate means to propagate them. So it also requires you to be able to have a team of people who can cultivate those relationships. A lot of times, for example, if you invite the imam to say a five minute talk at the program, two or three or four of his community members will come because they, they are fans of the imam. And so that's a, a clever way of getting a few people to come. You can even tell the imam, you know, can you bring 10 people or you can bring five people with you. And the imam will come because he's on the program. We give him five minutes. So we sacrifice five minutes, but we gain 10 or five new people who have now come to our program because of this imam. You know, so, so that's a, one of the, the, the different ways in which you have to be able to be very good at propagation. Propagation is everybody's business. So even though you have a team of experts that you will cultivate, it must be taught to the whole group. If you have an organization or a community of propagation, is everybody's business. Everybody's responsible for propagation. And if everyone bring one, your programs will have enough people. And then food. Nothing can ruin your program more than food. If you don't have proper food, if your program is offering food, make sure that it is well done. You know, make sure you, you have enough food. Make sure it's on time. Make sure if meals are properly cooked that, you know, it's in, in coolers. I went to a program in the Bronx one time and the man cooked chow mein or something like that at 10 o'clock in the morning. We were eating this food at five o'clock in the night. The brother had it in his car with the sun. The whole thing spoiled. And we're talking about two, 300 people. So when time for dinner came, we had literally nothing. We were scouring the whole Bronx now to see if we could find any halal place to buy food to feed these people for the night, you know, um, because somebody didn't do due diligence. You know, they assumed that they just kept the food in the need. So you have these kind of scenarios that develop sometimes. So you have to make sure that you have a smart menu. Part of your creativity and wow factor could also be, you know, um, how you prepare the food. Little things, for example, like you get a Hershey's Kisses and you just attach a little saying of the prophet tape to it, you know, and you put one of those at every meal, people get it, they pick up the Hershey's Kisses and they have this little saying of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or an eye of the Quran, you know, preferably you put a hadith, because sometimes, you know, they may use the eye inappropriately. And you, you have a saying of the Prophet, tape to that uh, Hershey's Kisses, you know, you will remember that. When you go home, you'll say, oh my gosh, this is, you know, I remember this. And so you can be creative in so many ways. Um, but make sure if you're going to have food, you know, that it's well organized. Um, the other thing that is important in programming when you're planning programs is to make sure your money is proper, that you are properly creating a proper budget for it. And, you know, they have this problem usually. Um, so, for example, this brother is assigned to buy utensils. So sometimes you will turn to him and says, can you pay it out of your own money? And then later on, we'll reimburse you. A very common thing that happens. You know, and then the brother can't get his money. Two, three weeks, the program is finished and we can't get back his money to him. That does not work really well. So you have to be able to ideally have the money up front. Don't ask people to spend their own money and then 
sometimes they, they, they don't have the proper receipts, so you can't recompense them. You know, you can't give them back uh, their money. And so it's really important that um, you have the money up front, you plan it well, and you make sure that um, there's proper budget, there's proper records, especially for finances that we should keep. You know, don't do it slipshod. You also need that record to know in future. And if someone donates something to the program, you should also give it a value. Because you may say, for example, man, this program, we run a, a, a seminar with 100 people and it only costs us 50 bucks. Why? Because somebody donated all the food. But that program didn't cost 50 bucks. You've got to put a value on the food that was donated. I said, we got $400 of food donated. So the program actually costs 450. So that the next time you're planning a program like that, where you're going to feed people, you know an exact figure. So you can't just assume that the things are donated. Everything that comes in in terms of expenses, you, whether it's donated or whether you paid for it, should be documented. So you can have a proper way of analyzing your program and see whether it makes sense or how you can cut down and so on. Everything that we plan will have consequences. Sometimes, you know, we said we plan and Allah plan. So a lot of times, even though we plan well, a circumstance may come that will affect the program that we didn't expect. You know, you get a sudden storm and, you know, or one of the speakers that was supposed, the main speaker that was supposed to come didn't show up. You know, so you always have to have some kind of backup plan. What will we do if this and this happens. So you should build that in and factor that in, that things are not always going to go as planned. And so you have to have some kind of backup. And then all of our programs, we should have evaluation. There should be several levels of evaluation. Number one, you should construct a form in which the participants can evaluate the program by filling it out. That gives us valuable feedback. You know, and it should have on that form some place where they can make a free form uh, write up of whatever else they feel that they would like to say about the program. It allows us to really measure whether we are succeeding or not. Uh, we would have already had a way to measure because we laid the goals in a very specific way so we can measure them with the combination of the feedback and the evaluation that we get then the team that is organizing the program should sit and also have an evaluation among themselves of how did they run the program? What was it? They will have a different level of, of seeing the program because as the organizers, a lot of time the participants don't know whether you made a mistake or not. Whatever you, you know, for them, every spoil is a style, you know, so they don't know what you had intended and how it came across wrong, you know, so they would have their own view, but it, the organizers would know that we messed up on this, even though the participants didn't realize it, but this was really a, a real problem for us. You know, we didn't do this right. So you should have an evaluation at that level as well. Now you also, part of your wow factor is you want the program to be remembered by the participants. So one good way is to give certificates when appropriate, you know, of attendance, you know, something as a memento that they attended this program, that they could use it. I remember there was a brother who uh, I used to teach people to recite Quran and I would give them a certificate after they finished the course that they have learned to memorize the Quran. They have learned to recite the Quran. And I used to teach all the folks and I had this brother, he, he, um, he came to the program and he, he participated and he learned to recite the Quran and he got his certificate for myself. And then about 20 years after, you know, I, he passed away and I attended his funeral and his son showed me, he said, look, among my father's belongings, we found this certificate which you had given him when he did that course with you. You know, the man had it framed, cherished, and held on to it, you know, as a very beautiful moment. And now was able to, his kids are able to see, you know, this moment. 
So it has a, 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 mem a memorable impact when you could provide some form of memento. That's why like when they have weddings, people give uh, favors, what they call favors, something that you take back from the wedding as a way to remember. But we can't afford expensive favors, but a simple certificate, which just is a piece of paper, you know, that you can do will go a long way. And it serves as a record for that person that they attend the program. And then you should also have proper documentation the evaluation that you actually do uh, in your committee should be in the form of, um, should also be documented. And you should try to create suitable forms that makes it easy to do. So you don't have to do um, imagine. So you said, you know, you can have stuff like food, you know, from one to 10, how, how was the, the you know, the um, taste of the food and you could you can have it this way in which you just quickly pick numbers and you could get a record of, you know, how we did. Um, this allows us to be able to keep track of these programs that we have um, in combination with a tip. If anybody have um, taping of the program and all of that becomes part of the documentation of that event. So you can repeat it easily. You can improve on it as well. And then sometimes when we finish the program, we think we're done. There's a lot of follow-ups that have to be done. And that's really important. Um, part of the planning has to be the cleanup. A lot of times we don't plan the cleanup, you know, of making sure that the venue is put back together in a proper way that of, of how we, we, we met it. You know, you've got to make sure that um, keep the names and addresses of the people who attended and the speakers. You want to be able to send out thank you letters uh, in, in cases where, you know, it's applicable to all concerned. Make sure all the bills are paid in a timely manner and don't just leave them hanging. Because when the program finishes, everybody thinks they just move on to the next one. You know, but you have to have a sense of how do we close this off, complete it. You know, make sure all the reports are done within a certain timeline. And so we So when you plan out pre program. programs like these, um, you will find that it's going to have tremendous impact on the lives of people. They will want to come. You know, I can give you an example of the RIS in Canada, you know, which is run by a group. Um, and it has become one of the biggest gatherings of Muslims, bypassing Isna and Ikna and all of them that used to run this thing 50, 60 years, that Isna and, and Ikna is running. And here's this group from Canada comes. And because they are professionals and they organize it in spectacular fashion. There's a group in Orlando that organize Eid, a private company of, of a group of brothers. And the way they put together it, incredible. You know, they actually have the Eid in, in either Universal Studios or something. They create a fantastic program. So you have people when they do it well, everybody wants to come to them. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help our masjids. If our messages begin to do it in this way, our people will feel proud to be associated with the Jama'ah and they will want to participate and contribute and volunteer. You know, and we'll be able to build something significant, inshallah, and move the hearts and minds of people to want to contribute, inshallah. As-salamu alaykum.